Well, and Mike, uh, it's been fascinating seeing all of that. Uh, now, he's known for his uh, love of nature, fascination with wildlife, but Chris Packham's on air uh, enthusiasm, his... Enthusiasm has hidden a struggle that he's faced throughout his life. In his new book, Chris reveals that he struggled with depression and even thoughts of suicide over the years. Yes, it's also the first time that Chris has talked publicly about his struggle with autism and how his love for animals helped him cope. Chris is a friend of the programme, really, I'd like to call you. Indeed. Lovely to see you. Fan back. of the programme. Oh, <laughs> oh well, that's fan nice. Of the Lovely to, have Lovely you on, Chris. to see you. Um, and it's really clear from the book that your fascination with um, animals, with insects, goes right back to when you were really tiny. Yeah, my parents say that as soon as I could crawl around the garden, I was picking things up and putting them into jam jars and shoeboxes and, 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 and small tanks, and it was newts and it was ladybirds. They were very suburban animals, nothing too big and too glamorous. They were all the little things, but immediately I found an exquisite beauty in them, and I was drawn to them for that, and, and the diversity of them and the colour, and they really did sparkle for me in, in those jars. And I was very lucky, my parents were very tolerant of my desire to bring everything mm. indoors, and whilst it started with relatively small organisms like ladybirds and tadpoles, by the time I got to my sort of eight or ten, then it was reptiles. And right. A bit older it was birds and mammals and we had fox cubs and badgers and all sorts of things and I the general rule it seemed to be although it was unwritten was that if I could get it into the bedroom then it could generally stay <laughs> not it perhaps in the bedroom it would get relegated to the garden but if I'd managed to smuggle it that far then my parents were soft-hearted enough not to see it being you know put turf back out into the wild. Right. I just listening to you now I mean there's a there's a real joy and an enjoyment that comes across from your broadcasting and your your, your love of the natural world and yet this book shows a, a, a sort of darkness that's been there at times and a real sadness in your life as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I grappled early on, as many people of my age would have done, um, with Asperger, um, because it wasn't recognised um, at school or, or at home. In fact, you know, if, if through into the... It was, it was diagnosed a long time before, but not in the public consciousness. And even throughout the 80s and 90s, people were grappling to understand what it was and to try and classify it and understand it. Um, and, and what I did... I mean, for years, I thought there was something wrong with me. And then there's, there's actually nothing wrong with us at all. We're just different, and, and, and that's it. And difference is not a crime and, um, but you know in, in those days it was quite isolating and, and therefore uh, difficult and, uh, and a high percentage of people who who have that condition uh, become depressed I think because they grapple with the difference they don't understand it uh, particularly if it's not diagnosed when they're young and, or, and they didn't get support mm -hmm. thankfully things are very different now it's it's identified relatively early and there's a tremendous amount of support available for, for, for children uh, and adults of course as well um, it's not, it's not in our nature to reach out for human assistance, as it were. In mm. fact, we do the, we do the, we do the opposite. Close, and, you know, yeah. and, and again, my passion for animals um, is, has always been there and it remains incredibly strong. And, and, you know, I've had closer bonds with animals than I have with some people. It's not that I don't enjoy relationships with people, I do, but I can have an equally intense relationship with an animal. And I think part of that might be down, down to the condition as well, in the intensity of the passion and the obsessive nature means that you know, when I was a kid and I had my pets, I'd, I'd focus on them to the exclusion of everything else. The rest of the world wouldn't happen. I was saying to someone the other day that I had a kestrel, which I write about in the book, and in 1975, and I don't know who won the FA Cup in 1975. <laughs> someone told me it was West Ham, but was, I mean, yeah. it was. <laughs> but I mean, I, I'd know, you know, so for 76, Southampton in 76, which was joyous um, for me. I lived in Southampton. Um, but the, no, the rest of the world ceased to exist. And then, of course, so if that is the case, and you explain it really well, I'm devastating when those pets die. Yeah, well. the kestrel was the whole world. I mean, and again, with an intensity that other people may not be able to, to understand. You know, the focus was so intense. There was nothing else apart from me and the bird. The bird was everything. It was the centre of my universe. I worshipped it. It was the most beautiful thing on the planet, mm. and it was mine. And then when I lost it, it was catastrophic. And again, you know, with no... Um, you know, detriment to my, my parents or anyone of that time at school, teachers and so on and so forth, they simply weren't able to identify the, 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 the trauma and, and mm. recognise what, what it was and, and to, to deal with it. It was an artefact of the age, nothing more. And you've had, a, you know, you've had an amazing career 
and people have enjoyed watching you and, and as we said earlier, your enjoyment of the natural world around you as well. We've got you know, the, the really wild show back in, what's this, two, the early 2000s, which was, you know, it was brilliant television at the time, wasn't it? It was. I mean, the, the, the team that made it were incredibly innovative and imaginative when it came to com, you know, communicating biological science to kids and we'd come up with all of these sorts of demonstrations like this. And this looks like it's a ribbon worm. Or, oh, uh, yes, tape worm apparently, yeah, but you probably, but you're the expert. Lace worm or something like that. <laughs> a worm. And we're demonstrating that the length of it there. Yeah. And I, I think that it was, we, we, you know, people worked really hard to come up with ideas so that when we packed those programmes full of, for, full of information and, and, and basic science, and, um, but because it was all practical demonstrations and we involved young people, and their faces lit up too when, you know, when, they, when they met the animals, then I think it was good TV. Yeah. Um, we make lots of assumptions, don't we, about people we see on telly? Um, I've always assumed, you know, the person we see on telly um, would not have depression, for example. I know that's a complete generalisation. Yeah, I mean, I'm very happy at the moment. But <laughs> yeah, but how did it affect, it's affected you? How has it affected you? Well, I think, I think it's the social side. I mean, the benefit, yeah. the thing with... I, I can't deny, and, and I'd be very keen to, it, to say, that, that Asperger's has provided me with enormous opportunities. Mm -hmm. Because the ability to see things with such intensity mm -hmm. and to record them and to... Um, and to see patterns in them and to process them and to um, systemise them. Uh, and also to recall that with the same intensity is an artefact of the people with minds like mine. Yeah. The downside is, of course, that the, uh, is the social side. So it was very difficult through sort of adolescence. I mean, uh, early on, you know, I had people I'd hang out and play football and do all of those sorts of things. But when it got to adolescence, the separation grew because my difference was more prominent at that point. You know, they wanted to snog girls, I wanted to fly a kestrel. I mean, you know... <laughs> <laughs> Snogging girls did come later. <laughs> eventually, eventually. Um, so it was, it was that sort of uh, separation. So yeah. the social side has been, uh, at times, has been an enormous handicap. But by the time I got to my mid-twenties, I, I did then begun, I'd begun to understand I, 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 the frustration, the confusion of, of, of that separation, the difference. Um, I'd, I'd begun to sort of accept it, and I thought, I've got to deal with it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I'm looking at you. I can look at you now in the eye rather than, oh. talk, to the, rather than talk to the keyboard, which was what was going on. And, and, and I sort of realised that if I wanted to do what I wanted to do, which was communicate and, and, and continue that passion for animals, and I had this enormous opportunity on The Really Wild Show to do that, mm. I mean, that was like, you know... I was pinching myself then, I'm still pinching myself now. I mean, I, I, I'm so fortunate to have the job that I do. Um, and, and in order to keep that job, I needed to then start engaging with people, right. not just animals. I mean, up until that point, I'd been out, you know, in, in the woods with, with my badgers and kestrels. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I was in a studio with a team of people who I needed to relate to. So I, I worked really, really hard on, on that. Well, it's lovely to watch you. Thank yeah. you so much for coming to talk to us, Chris. Thank you very much. Not at all. Indeed. Thank you very much. Great to see you again, as always. Thank you for an honest assessment yeah. of, you know, your life as, as I say, well. not all negative and great hope for people who have the condition. They, they can do things. It certainly is. And the book is called Fingers in a Sparkle Jar. Chris says he's a fan of the programme, no doubt a fan of Carol Kirk. Obviously. Well. <laughs> Here well, she not is. All that she doesn't always bring us good news, though. That's right. <laughs> <No. laughs> Here she is again. Morning. Good morning. I'd love to bring you good news every day, Chris. In fact, I'd love to bring everybody good news. But we have got some fabulous...